Hello, everyone. My name is Manny Ramos, your host of Rise Up, Real Issues and Stories of Every One of Us podcast. Our guest for this episode is Arlene De La Pena. But first, let me talk about who we are. I'm Manny Ramos, a board member of PNAA and a past president of the Philippine Nurses Association of Central Florida here in Orlando. I'm a professor of nursing at Valencia College in Orlando and an adjunct faculty at William Patterson University. With me today is my co-host, Mindy Ofiana, and our guest for this inaugural episode of Rise Up, Arlene De La Pena and Dr. Jamil Nagtalon Ramos. So, Mindy. Oh, hi. Good How afternoon. are you, Mindy? Oh, good afternoon. My name is Mindy Ofiana, and I'm the Legislative Committee Chair of PNAA and the Corresponding Secretary of PNAA Foundation. I was a past president of our local chapter here, PNA Southern California. And prior to my retirement, I served as the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Nursing Officer of one of the medical centers at the KPC Health Systems. Uh, before we begin our conversation, uh, there are some people who may not know what podcast is. To put simply, it is actually another method to entertain, to humor, or educate. It is actually um, like a television show wherein there's a, um, many series that is being done and that it is um, shown in as episodes. This publication was made possible by Cooperative Agreement CDC RFA IP212106 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC HHS. With us today as our first guest for this inaugural episode of Rise Up is Arlene De La Pena, a Filipino-American U.S. Army veteran, a registered nurse, producer, actress, filmmaker, wife, and a mother of twins. Arlene graduated from the Washington State University with her Bachelor of Science in Nursing and was commissioned as a second lieutenant Army Nurse Corps officer into the United States Army. She worked as a trauma surgical intensive care unit nurse and obtained the National Board Certification for Critical Care Registered Nurse before deployment to Iraq. Arlene served in the military for almost a decade before transitioning into filmmaking. Arlene held a leadership position in PhilArm Creative, a nonprofit Filipino American organization promoting a more culturally integrated and diverse entertainment industry. She was a podcast host and producer for Phil Am Creative Voices and has been a producer, actor, and military consultant on various films and media. Arlene is based out of Hawaii and Los Angeles. Arlene, welcome to Rise Up. Welcome, Arlene. Aloha. How are you guys? Aloha. I might have some noisy coworkers. I have the twins with me. They're dying to say <laughs> no, hello. <laughs> no problem. Oh, wow. No problem. <laughs> So, How are Keanu and Aurora? They are doing wonderful. They're huge now. They are actually turning six months tomorrow. Oh, oh six months already. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Eileen, why did you become a nurse? So I became a nurse. It, it's kind of a family tradition. So my mom was a nurse, all her sisters. I have many cousins, um, aunties, uncles, and many relatives who are nurses. So um, I definitely wanted to uh, go into a career that was sustainable to the things I wanted to do with life, which was travel, uh, have a lot of pocket money and, um, you know, save lives. So I became a nurse. Oh, yeah. So you were born here in the USA? Actually, no, I was born in Germany. Oh, oh. wow. Was your mom um, military nurse too? Uh, she was not. So she went to nursing school in the Philippines and then went uh -huh. to Germany. And so she went there in 1970. And then she met my dad, who was a U.S. Um, soldier. And he was in the army who was stationed in Germany. And uh, after six months of knowing each other, they got married. Oh, <laughs> and wow. They had my sister. <laughs> and then I came two and a half years later. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh. So how is that growing up 
in um in the military i guess you could say in a military family i guess right growing up in the military it was um it was fairly easy because you know we didn't really move around a lot we left germany when i was about four years old came to california that was the first state that we came to and then i started uh kindergarten in washington state and i stayed Uh there from kindergarten until um Uh, freshman year of high school, we moved to San Antonio, Texas. And so we were in Texas. Um, I started college there and then I transferred out to Washington State. So it wasn't too bad for me. We didn't have to, uh, you know, move every few years. But I think moving, going into high school is always really hard. But, you know, I I mean, my parents, you know, I, I come from a very strict family. My dad was a drill sergeant and my mom was a nurse. So it's like, you know, <laughs> it was like this. You know? yeah. like, so I was very disciplined, you know, growing up. So when I went on my own for college, I had no problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. I, I can bet. I, I bet you. But there must be some challenges that you have faced when you were studying to become a nurse. Oh, of course. I was doing Army ROTC while I was in college. And so that's one of the three different ways that you can commission as an officer um, in the military. And so, um, you know, a lot of people just thought, oh, she wears a uniform. She has this class. No, I was up at 6 a.m. doing physical uh, fitness with everybody at, uh, Mm -hmm. I don't even remember, like 5 a.m. before school started. And, you know, as a college student, you just want to go out, have fun with your friends. But no. Oh, I have to get up because I have an inspection or I have to go to the field over the weekend and and sleep with no tents you know and, like, <laughs> in the, and survive in the wilderness and play infantry officer you know so uh, it, it was a little challenging in that way because I wanted to really you know just kind of be with my friends and enjoy that college experience which I did but at the same time I really had to earn my scholarship doing ROTC and nursing school at the same time because you know clinicals too it starts very uh-huh. early so right. you still have to keep up with your academics and then even your physical fitness you know they're they're always looking at all of those things Oh I see So Arlene, after graduating from college and earning your license as a nurse, did you immediately go into the army as a nurse? I did. So uh, first things first, you have to pass the NCLEX. And when you do ROTC, if you don't pass the NCLEX, I think it's like by the second or third time, they can actually branch you into anything in the military. So I could end up as infantry or logistics or transportation or military intelligence, anything, right? And so you don't truly become an Army Nurse Corps officer until you pass the NCLEX. So mm-hmm. after that, I went to Officer Basic, which was for all of um, uh, medical Uh, branches in the army. And so I went back home to San Antonio, Texas, and I trained, I think, for almost three months. And then after that, I went to my first duty station, which was Washington, uh, D.C., at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I see. So, you know, um, with with COVID um, ongoing, like uh, like our health crisis, can you tell us about your decision to get the COVID vaccine? Was it a hard decision for you to do it? So I think the early recommendations, because I was um, I was pregnant with the twins during the pandemic. And so let's see, I got pregnant in August and then the recommendations through uh, the American College of Obstetrics uh, and Gynecology, ACOG. It came out, I believe, in November, December, where they were they started to uh, let people know, you know, the mRNA uh, COVID vaccine is acceptable. You know, it. Um, It's deemed safe. And for me, you know, with the military, because we're so highly trained with different um, different types of medicine, with whether it's inpatient in the hospital, outpatient, if you're in a rural setting or even tropical medicine when you're out there, you know, wherever. Right. So we've been learning about mRNA vaccines for a long time. It was nothing new. And then on top of that, if you're a soldier, you just get in the line and you get vaccinated and you don't even know half the time. <laughs> but you just say, OK, you know, because if it's it's for your protection. Yeah. And a lot of nursing research actually occurs during deployments or during, you know, the military does a lot of research. So I felt like I was uh, very well versed in that realm. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the biggest thing for me Uh, is because, you know, here I am in second trimester in December, you know, should I get it right away or just wait until third trimester? And because the vaccine rollout didn't really happen until December for 
um, out here in Hawaii, it's called kapuna, which are like our senior citizens. You know, they were the first ones, the vulnerable populations. And then, uh, and military, of course, gets the vaccines very early too. So my husband was vaccinated in December. And so um, I had to kind of wait my turn until um, my my category was eligible. But as soon as I was eligible, I was able to get it. And by then I was eight months and then nine months pregnant for the first and second dose. So I'm proud to say that the twins do have antibodies as well for the COVID vaccine. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. So Arlene, when you got the vaccine, because I know when I got mine, I mean, I had sore arms. I had a slight fever the, the day after, but after that I was fine. But how was it for you as a pregnant woman when you got it? Uh, were there any side effects? Okay, so I don't know if God just knows I need an easy life, <laughs> but I had no symptoms. None, oh, wow. both times. Wow. So the first time I was actually an inpatient because I was having um, a lot of um, uh, pre-contractions. And so, um, and so they were worried that I was going to go into labor. And I don't know if I was just already exhausted from being pregnant with twins or what, but I mean, my arm was sore maybe for like, maybe like half a day, six hours, if that. <laughs> but I, wow. I literally had no symptoms. And then... Oh, wow. Um, I went uh, back in before I got induced um, at nine months uh, uh -huh. to get my second shot. And again, I was expecting like, okay, maybe I'll feel really sick or tired or something and nothing. I <laughs> I was very lucky. <laughs> I felt uh, very free, you know, but again, I don't know if it's my body is just like so overwhelmed with, you know, I'm carrying uh, over 12 pounds of children <laughs> inside uh -huh. me <laughs> or what. <laughs> but, you know, um, my mom, she did not have any symptoms. She's 70 years old. And then my husband, he said he felt tired, but the next morning he ran 10 miles. So I don't know how tired he really was. Um, but all of us, we ended up getting Pfizer. Oh, okay. I see. That's good. So you were pregnant and then you delivered. Was there any side effect other than they having the anti antibodies for the kids? Did they have any symptoms or anything that you are going to be worried about? Because I don't uh, think so. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that they're uh, that they had any issues. I mean, um, it, it was kind of a, a very eventful birth for me. I ended up losing a lot of blood, but the twins oh. came out perfect. Their APGAR scores were both very high. Um, you know, they were super healthy. They were huge for twins. Um, they were both over six pounds. And so, um, and I delivered at 37 weeks and four days. Oh, I see. Right on the normal thing, huh? Uh, this this uh, this was your first pregnancy, right, Arlene, and and the first babies? No, they're number two and number three. Oh, that's and so right. We have that's a seven year old uh, who's in second grade. How is he doing? <laughs> He's, you know, he was so excited to become Kuya, and then he realized he has to share. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's doing really well now. I think at first he was like, you know, because he 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 had been praying for this moment for a really long time. And so he was so happy when they were born. But, you know, in his mind, they were going to be, you know, there and he could play with them very easily. He didn't know that, oh, they sleep for a long time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they eat a lot, you know, and uh -huh. and sometimes they cry. So, you know, it's just a adjustment for him. I see. You know, when I, went, when I was in high school, I wanted to become an actress too. And um, I am amazed how you are. Yeah, but my mom was not for it. <laughs> you are going to be a nurse. That's what my mom said. So when you're talking about your mother, I can remember my mom. May she rest in peace. But anyway, how did you transition from being a staff nurse to um, being an actress? So I'm kind of... Uh... I'm like the 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 cat with nine lives and probably have like three lives left. My whole life is like a lifetime story. Rodney, I know you know. <laughs> so <laughs> so, uh, so basically when I was on active duty, um, I decided to take the rest of my vacation days and go to uh, weddings on both sides of the family. And so uh, my husband's cousin was getting married in Mexico. We were supposed to be there for three days. Then go to San Francisco, meet my family, and then fly back to the Philippines for my cousin's wedding. And I was maid of honor. Unfortunately, you know, on 
on day two of Mexico, I was in this freak accident during the reception of the wedding. And oh. a rogue wave took over the beach where the reception was at. It oh, picked wow. up um, a metal fire pit. It rode mm. the wave and it hit me and only me. And so mm. uh, my saving grace was that, you know, I had my back to the ocean, which is rule number one. Never turn your back to the ocean. (laughs) And and so, you know, I'm my husband and I, you know, were a few feet apart. Vincent, who was two years old at the time, was playing in front of us Uh on the sand and like climbing onto the dance floor, which is like, you know, sitting on the beach. And the wave came and I was leaning forward to go get Vincent because the, the wave submerged him under the water. It went above my husband's waist. And we were at the highest point of the beach. Oh, so I leaned wow. forward to try to get him. And then something hit me. And I was like, is that hot or cold? It was. It all happened very quickly. But uh, long story short, no one else got burned. I was the only one who got burned. Uh, and so I was flown out of Mexico back to the United States to oh, San Antonio, wow. Texas, to the burn unit where all my friends work. The irony, I'm a burn trauma ICU nurse. <laughs> so oh, like I had the most knowledge oh God, you know, right. yeah. uh, when I was there. Anyhow, made it back to San Antonio. Um, I... I ended up getting uh, cared by all of my peers. Um, you know, everybody knew me as the girl on fire in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up learning how to, you know, rewalk. It took me six months. So <gasps> I got out of the military uh, a month later after my official end date, just so I can get my care. And uh-huh. I, uh, my husband and I were moving to Los Angeles because he got picked up for fellowship at UCLA. So to answer your question... The reason why I became an actress was because I could not even be a nurse. And I saw what old age would look like. You know, I my I had to ask my mom to come back from um, the family reunion. I had to ask her to come back early right after the wedding because I couldn't even do my own wound care. And at the time, my husband, who was still active duty, was stationed in El Paso, Texas, and I was in Washington State. And so I couldn't drive. I couldn't. I couldn't do my own wound care. I couldn't even watch my own son. So when my husband simply asked me, you know, do you want to be a stay-at-home mom? Or, you know, do you want to, uh, you know, go back to the ICU? Or my plan was anesthesia school, actually. You know, do you want to pursue that? Um, I said, I don't know, you know. And I asked him, if you could be anything, you know, what would you be? And he was like, I would be a surgeon. And I was like, wow, that's boring. (laughs) So... (laughs) Already a surgeon. He's a urologist. Uh huh. And um. So Arlene, um, you you had a leadership position with Film Arm Create Phil Am Creative, and uh, when we met in Boston, you were uh, you and your team were filming Nurse Unseen. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. So Nurse Unseen is a, a documentary about Filipino nurses during the pandemic. Uh, a little secret. I've seen the rough cut. Wow. <laughs> and I see lots of familiar faces, which is <laughs> awesome. And I just want to thank um, Mary Joy, uh, uh, Dia Garcia, and also Carmina um, Batista, because without them and uh, being able to connect with them, we would not have had the privilege of filming, you know, the leadership conference in Boston with PNAA in, in 2021. And, and that footage is so key to really showing all the different sides of uh, Filipinos and what they've contributed to, um, to uh, nursing and, and, um, you know, it's such an important documentary because nobody has really highlighted Filipino nurses and the contributions. And I think it's about time, especially with the statistic that, you know, at one point at the height of the pandemic, the nurses who have died of COVID, um, Filipinos made up 31.5 percent, which is huge. Mm-hmm. And we only make up 4% of the entire nursing uh, population. And Mm -hmm. that's about 150,000. And so that's a staggering statistic. And, you know, we started the documentary to answer why. Why are so many Filipino nurses dying? So we look forward to, you know, showcasing it to everybody. We just submitted uh, to a very big film festival. So fingers crossed, everybody pray. (laughs) I pray daily that we make it in. (laughs) And so that way... You know, we can really, um, we hope to get picked up and be distributed to um, many different outlets and 
be able to share everything that we've um, discovered and want to show everybody. Wow, that's awesome to be able to portray, I mean, um, share to the world the kind of nursing we have as Filipino-American nurses. So you are now heavily in the enter entertainment world. Uh, just yesterday, I saw your film on balancing sacrifice. Ah, you so, saw it. Yes, and I, and it's, eight, it's eight minutes, and and it's and it uh, apparently it got to number four out of the ten ten entries, and you became the best actress. So, how are you going to merge this life of acting and family life? To be honest, how are you going to balance that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been acting for. Um, basically since 2016. That's when I moved to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I felt kind of a sense of renewal and just trying to figure out what makes me happy. Because with my husband, you know, he said that he's basically doing everything that makes him happy and he wouldn't want to do anything else. So he asked me, well, what would you do? And I told him, well, I saw what old age is like. Maybe I'll just become an actress. And I wasn't entirely serious about it, but you know, he was like, well, if that makes you happy, then you should absolutely do that. You know, and of course, the practical side of me is like, can I can I make um, a good living off of that? Can we take that financial hit? <laughs> you know? And uh, he was like, yeah, you know, we'll figure it out. And, and so we did. And um, so to answer your question, um, you know, balancing between acting, being a mom and a nurse, you know, it's kind of just like working the floor, right? You just have to like kind of triage and figure out what's doable and what's not. And I'm a firm believer if there's a will, there's a way. That's true. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for uh, putting a focus on Filipino nurses um, and your work towards uh, promoting a more culturally integrated and diverse entertainment industry. Um, there's got to be a... Um, an inspiration there, uh, Arlene, for you pushing these things and and moving this agenda um, for Filipino Filipino American community. Yeah. So growing up, I did not grow up around a lot of Filipinos. Often, I was one of three in my entire grade um, of Filipinos, and there was really not even a lot of different diverse cultures. Um, that I went to school with. And so, um, whoops, you okay? <laughs> like, look at me like, yes, I am. Joke's on you. There you go. Um, so the motivation to really push, you know, this agenda of highlighting Filipinos and, and people of color, the Asian community really stems from the lack of diversity that I had growing up. And, you know, there's a lot of Filipinos, especially in my age or even slightly younger, that they they don't really pay attention or they could care less. But, you know, it's so important to be proud that you're Filipino and let everybody know that, you know, Filipinos are very special. We're all, I feel like, artistas deep down inside. You know, we're all trained to sing, dance and, you know, always have lots of parties and potlucks. And I just feel like that's such a wonderful message to share because not every um, community really has that sense. And uh, having this Filipino American culture is very different than growing up in the Philippines, you know, and, and I have a partly German upbringing too. And so it's just all very different um, in different sides of the United States and overseas. And I just feel like we have such wonderful stories to tell. We might as well share it and document it and have it live forever. That's right. Yeah, I, I'm so proud of what you do and how you transition from a military uh, personnel to being a mother. To, I, I mean, nursing personnel as, an, as a nurse, right? In military, a mother, and now an actress. So uh, to an end, and you know, we have a, how many more minutes do we have? A few more minutes. What do you think would be your advice for expectant mothers out there who needs to decide on having vaccination? So I think for the mothers out there, you know, it there's a lot of real research that you should um, look into. I would definitely talk to your healthcare providers and ask for the specific journals, not just what you read on social media. Um, you know, there, I think it's important to understand how these vaccines work and make the best decision for you because not everybody um, 
is really eligible for the vaccine. For example, if you have cancer or if you have other like different types of comorbidities and you get pregnant, of course, like there's always a risk. So, you know, talk to your medical team and make a sound decision because if you're able to help protect your babies, you know, without them having to directly get the vaccine because it's not offered to them yet, you know, we might as well do it, you know, save, save the people around you because I didn't just do it for myself. I did it because our seven-year-old son, he is not able to get vaccinated as of uh-huh. uh, yet. You know, my my mom, you know, she has comorbidities. She's older. I, I want to protect her. And of course, my husband. And so it's truly a, a way to tell everybody that how much you love them and that you care for them. And we can do it all together if we, you know, look into it and make the right decisions for ourselves. And that is all that we have for this episode. I want to thank our guest, Arlene De La Pena. And my co-host, Mindy Ofiana. Our director and producer, Rodney Cajudo. And our executive producers, PNAA president, Dr. Maria Garcia Dia. And our PNAA executive director, Carmina Bautista. Join us every Wednesday here on Rise Up. Until then, keep on rising. See you next week. This publication was made possible by Cooperative Agreement CDC RFA IP212106 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC HHS.